On to the main event tonight, guys. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, with us tonight Mr. David Hill, a founding member of TechApp and president of NRA Products. David is one of Canada's leading experts in residential and small commercial ventilation and technology systems. NRA Product is a BC based company that design and manufacture ventilation related products with a focus on providing fresh and filtered outdoor air for your home, indoor pool, and small commercial buildings. David will be updating us on the current ventilation code of BC building code, where, we're, where we are and where we're heading in the future. So please join me in welcoming David Hill. Thank you very much, Peter. Is this on? Yep. I've been asked to get this into 45 minutes. I will try my best. I got 64 slides to try to paint a story of what ventilation is all about. Thank you, John. But this is a quick introduction. Thank you very much, Peter and Norm for the opportunity to present here today to you. And Catherine for staffing the Tech booth, thank you. And Bandix for videoing this, because what we've been trying to do at Tech in the last while is video presentation presenters so that we have people out of town that can't get to meetings, we have the ability to serve them, who are not an economic driving distance, but some of the people that we can bring into Vancouver, and this will hopefully be useful for people who aren't able to be here. I got 63 slides. I'd like to introduce that relation to you in a very light overview in a way that you probably had never thought about before. Because really, underneath it all, it's very, very simple. And I'm going to focus on what is ventilation for, which is really ventilations for people. That's the whole objective of the game. I'd also like to introduce um, a little bit two courses that we've been working on like mad. One is Principles of Moving Air. And I have to thank John Makepeace for participating in that course in its beta form 13 months ago. And when that was rewritten, uh, Norm Brusnick put a serious time and effort into reviewing of it. So we're proud now of something that's not equal anywhere in North America. It's a very good duct design manual. And it's all written around as a course and a manual. We've also, of course, got a ventilation course that this is the presentation is based on. And lastly, um, if this sort of thing is of interest to any of you, I'd be certainly on behalf of TAC would be willing to come to your individual offices and maybe present to you if you find this is of use to yourself, maybe to others in your own staff. Okay. It should work, because it did work. Okay, these are the two courses, Principles of Moving Air and the Ventilation Guidelines. The course on Principles of Moving Air is being held February the 28th, March the 1st, and the Ventilation the most recent one coming up will be February the 22. But first of all, we'd like to discuss some terms. It's really, really important that we don't mix terms because ventilation is full of a whole bunch of myths and stuff that just isn't relevant. Let's go right back to the simple basics. It's a universal need for health and safety for occupied buildings. And there's really three jobs for ventilation. We often don't think about these when we're dealing with ventilation for people. There's the winter ventilation, which is really a residential term to describe the fact that a building's closed up and we need to have an air exchange for people's health. And completely apart from that, we have human activities of using the bathroom, the shower, the toilet, and cooking, that we expect to be able to use these activities inside a house and do so safely. So we have a completely separate requirement. We have to have localized exhaust in those rooms, completely apart from the fact that we are living, breathing cornflake burners, producing odor, carbon dioxide, and moisture that we have to dilute through ventilation. And then lastly, summer ventilation is a bit of a slang term, but it's the idea of free cooling, which in this city, where we have very, very low enthalpy loads in the summer, you can actually get a half a ton of cooling by just simple air exchange in a building overnight. But really, ventilation implies an air exchange with outdoors. And the recent research shows as bad as the outdoor air is in, in a lot of places, indoor air, which is really your house is an island in the middle of a sea of air, 
indoor air in a residential building typically is a lower quality than the outside air which surrounds it. But the term ventilation is often misused to describe the conditioning of the air, which is completely different. Air circulation has huge advantages, and the public really confuse ventilation, which is an exchange, with air circulation. And this blurring of these two terms goes on throughout our industry, and it's really quite sad. There's very good reason to circulate air. Heat, cool, humidification, dehumidification, air cleaning, destratification. In three-floor houses, the stratification is a big, huge problem because when air leaks out the top, it comes into the bottom and sits in the floor. And yet one of the big debates is how do you heat your house when, in fact, you're often compensating for runaway stack action when you try to really keep that basement comfortable. And it's very hard to do with heating on the buildings or runaway freight train with air leakage. So air circulation is good for a whole bunch of things, one of which you can be stratified. But really, circulation is not ventilation, and I hope that you'll never ever fall trapped to that because that's occurring today everywhere that we speak. So to repeat, <coughs> heating and cooling is required for thermal comfort, which actually defines in the standard 52. And of course, ventilation is required for the health of people, but in case of residences, it also has a big, huge effect on the health of the building. And that's of course standard 62 for residences. I'd like to make one really, really good point, though, and that is this situation. Just like with the medical doctor, you're supposed to make the patient better without killing them, you're not supposed to go backwards. Well, the most important thing in residential ventilation is we make sure that combustion appliances are looked after properly before we worry about ventilating for the people occupancy, the degradation of the indoor air quality from the people effect. This was a really sad situation where a woman and her daughter drove into Fairmont Hot Springs Christmas Eve, 1999. They entered the house at 6 o'clock. That lady was pronounced that she had died at 10 o'clock that night, and her daughter is brain dead. It's a sad state of affairs right now, but this was buried for 10 years, and it was only because we got fed up and attacked up and decided to push the freedom of information about the actual file, even though us in the ventilation committee were aware of this within 24 hours of this death occurring. Well, what essentially happens is, it's really, really simple. We have a, a duplex here. We've got a, a B-vent here side by side with a high efficiency furnace. And what was happening is the boiler was in, improperly installed. No mixing valve. The cold water return was cold. That B-vent chase was outside the conditioned space for the full height. And essentially, what was happening is that chimney wouldn't draft. The appliance was overfired, so that high CO source and eventually ended up killing this woman. And it's really, really a sad state of affairs when that occurred. It was only made worse, too, because when they came into that house, they turned the heat up for both the boiler, for the radiant downstairs, as well as the furnace for upstairs. When the furnace started, the return air leakage depressurized the basement. As a result, all the CO produced by that appliance immediately went into the air handler and was perfectly distributed. And the insult to injury was is that there was about 50 pot lights in the ceiling of this, so all the air escaping the top just increased the negative in the basement below. So there's about six contributing factors to this death. And ultimately, the plumber that pulled the gas permit for this committed suicide. But the sad thing about this information was not shared to the gas theories around the province, as it should be, so we can all learn from the mistakes that I was paid so very, very dearly for. This happened closer to home, a very good friend of mine, Scott, he just got a, smoke, a CO detector in his house at Maple Ridge. It was a hood case where a boiler was improperly installed, it had no mixing, the air, the water was coming back at substandard temperatures. The boiler fired, and there was a ridiculous amount of CO producing, this house was about 20 years old, and I guess it just got worse and worse and worse, and cleaning out that boiler resulted in three quarts of soot coming out of the boiler. It's complete lack of maintenance, but it was completely improperly installed at the beginning. The point that I'm trying to make is that ventilation is important for people, but we've got to really make damn sure that the biggest single thing that takes people out is these combustion appliances are operating safely. <clears throat> what we've got to remember is that the human body loves carbon monoxide. And we've got to look at what methane really is when we talk about natural gas. It's got a carbon molecule in the middle and it's got the hydrogens. They burn off really, really quickly without problems. You get the water vapor. But that leaves the carbon, which is a very slow burn. And there's two steps to making it safe. 
Carbon dioxide is not the least bit of a threat to humans. We tend to look at it commercially as a nice thing to measure, so we can look important, go to a job site, and you say the carbon dioxide's a little over limit. That's not the issue. The issue is, is that that carbon is only given enough time and temperature and oxygen to burn the first step. That carbon dioxide becomes lethal. And carbon dioxide is preferred by your blood 400 times in preference to oxygen or surrounding this. So don't ever screw with carbon dioxide. It is absolutely lethal. Okay, I'd like to take a little bit of a history for ventilation so you can understand where I'm going with this so that the conclusions I reach make a lot of sense to you. And I've put together nine slides that take you all the way back from the 1700s up to current practice. You can see the ebbs and flows of our awareness in ventilation in small buildings. Ben Franklin was one of the smarter people in the United States. He wrote the U.S. Constitution, which is seen as a really a beautiful model document for the success of a nation's development. He was a publisher in Boston, and he wrote the line, I consider fresh air an enemy and closed with extreme care every crevice in the room I inhabit. Experience has convinced me of my error, and I am persuaded that no common air from without is so unwholesome as the air within a closed room that has been breathed and not changed. This was written in 1776, give or take. Let's advance 100 years, and an architect wrote a book, and believe it or not, he actually dedicated a chapter to heating and ventilating. and I don't see how an architect would ever do that, but that's an aside. Chapter 13, it's the last in the book. The opening sentence of the paragraph of that chapter says, there is no subject directly connected with domestic life on which there's so large amount of popular ignorance is ventilation. In my opinion, it's a dead ringer for what's going on today. We've been peddling ventilation in our company for 38 years, and the ignorance out there is absolutely massive. And it hasn't changed much in 38 years. The closing sentence in that whole chapter is the want of attention arises from the fact that the poison of breathing bad air is a slow one, and its effects are only felt little by little. I would say that would be fairly typical of the sort of awareness that we have in society today. And peddling ventilation is a, is a tough slide. When I was a young person, I was raised in Sardis, and I was raised and went to grade one in an elementary school that's very, very similar to this one, which is standing in Chilliwack right this very, very moment. The buildings were built in the 1920s when there was a huge uh, North American awakening of the needs for ventilation, specifically in school classrooms, when you throw 30 kids into a small space, it was recognized that kids would learn better with fresh air and they wouldn't get unhealthy. The beauty of this school was, that, like to say, exactly the same as what I grew up in, in Sardis, right on Vetter Road, downtown Sardis. It was a building built in the 20s and 30s and had a big, huge passive exhaust stack in the very middle of the building, which provided ongoing exhaust from that school. The beautiful thing about the classroom we were in is quite neat. They had 12-foot ceilings, and they had three rows of windows. The top row would have an awning, which had a worm screw and a string, two strings, so the teacher could open that up and open up the window. And the air would fall down and over top of a big, huge baseboard heater that was cast iron, which is heated by the boiler. So that would tend to lift the air, keep this fresh air up above our head spaces, and there's a huge passive transfer from the door of the classroom to the corridor. Extremely effective, completely fanless, did a beautiful job, was efficient, completely transparent, it worked. Well, what was happening is in the 1920s, there was a huge social awakening in the need for ventilation, and that just predated by a little bit the ability to provide cooling. So when cooling came on, ventilation tended to subside in our awareness of society as we became so conscious of the ability to strip moisture of the air in the summer and have a cooled environment. And this was especially the case where when I was living in Texas for three years, you lived by the Gulf Coast, Air conditioning is the best thing since sliced bread, just to strip out the stupid amount of Gulf, Gulf Coast humidity that we were subject to. But here's a situation where it really, really worked. It's kind of interesting, too, that Ashby, Ashray, was called Ashby until 1954. And V was prominently displayed in the, uh, the, the name as ventilation was a strong suit. 
But now we've created ASHRAE, which is air conditioning, where air conditioning initially implied the conditioning of air and ventilation. Our conditioning of air has tended to ignore ventilation for the last 20 years. We're only waking up to the need that we've got to re-emphasize it in the conditioning of our buildings. We want them to be healthy. I had an opportunity to go through the Squamish Railway Museum here last summer, and it was absolutely great. I highly recommend it. But there were two cars that struck me side by side. One was an older car that had ventilation grills in the roof, so the train goes down the track, it creates a bit of a venturi effect, the exhaust comes out of the top, comes in through the windows, the window leakage and opening windows. I walked into this car and it absolutely smelled great, healthy, dry, it was great. I walked into the next generation car that was proudly announced that it was air conditioned, which basically meant it had no friggin' outdoor air at all, and it smelled like mold and mildew and it just really, really quite ugly. But they were promoting the fact it was air conditioned, which is fine, but the air conditioning had completely, seemingly, obliter uh, 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 ignored the need for ventilation in rather, a rather confined space like that. But these two cars, night and day, were different to my nose, and I get pretty good at it being in the ventilation business for as long as they have. This was simply full of mold and mildew. This was a very healthy, dry car to walk through as a tourist. I think one of the greatest pieces of research that Ashray has done over the years was actually done by Dr. Ole Fanger. He was in Canada here about 20 years ago. It was wonderful to hear him speak to 400 people. You could hear a pin drop because of the attention and the respect that he was given for his work. I think one of his greatest things that he did is that he ended up doing some very simple, very, very simple research and a simple question. How much air do we need for ventilation? And it was absolutely beautiful. What he did is he sticks a human and what is essentially a telephone booth. It's a glass telephone booth. On the top of the telephone booth, they'd have a, a small system that would allow them to introduce varying amounts of outdoor air and proper air exchange and a mixing system with a fan. It's a self-contained fan, and they could stack this on the street corner in Copenhagen. This is simple, practical research that I really respect. I mean, my dad was a scientist who's a practical guy, so is Dr. Oldefanger. <coughs> so they stick this human on the street corner in Copenhagen. They put a little wee hole through the side of this uh, glass container at the five foot level and they'd march a hundred people on their way to work in the morning and stick their nose in this, this, this container and they would give them an opportunity to rate this individual inside as green, orange, or red. Red, place stinks. Green is healthy, orange they were quite sure they were, they were not making a decision on it. And believe it or not, the ventilation that we've used throughout the world, the rates we've done are actually all based on that very, very simple fundamental research. Now, of course, being a scientific dude, the guy wanted to create some sort of level playing field, so they made sure before they threw a human in the telephone booth, they had clean underwear and they had to shower that morning. That way they had a certain degree of uniformity in the testing. But it's quite beautiful, and it's surprising how well that has actually worked all the way through the system and has actually generated the standard by which we work for in many, many countries in the world today. So summarizing what is two or three years of work is actually quite simple. We were ventilating, he was ventilating for odor based on the nose of a visitor, which is a lot more discerning than the nose of someone who's in an existing space. So the visitor would go by, and if you had 100 people go by, what this sliding graph said is that you can never satisfy everyone. Even if you ventilated that thing at 94.5 CFM, you're still ticking off 4% of the people. It's not something where you can never satisfy for everyone because there's lots of people. And what they basically said, well, if we tick off 20%, that's just an economic trade-off, and that established a ventilation rate of about 11 cubic feet per minute. And that was based on odor. That was the whole premise of the study, because that was something you could quantify objectively with these independent objective observers. Kind of fascinating. I think all this uh, here at home on the front page of the Ashray magazine in 1997 when they had a Schlieren photograph of a young girl. They used a, a 39 inch diameter mirror, and by means of smoke and mirrors and regular photographic film, you can actually record visually the density differences of air due to the temperature. And you can see she's standing there right now. It's almost like she has hot coals in her hand, because you can see the density of the air is different as it's rising. And what's happening is that she's setting up a convection plume by her own body heat of roughly 85 watts. And you know this is the case because in the era of smoking, cigarette smoke would always rise in its own plume. Well, each of us are doing that right now. Our odor and moisture and carbon dioxide is rising in a plume that we create 
by the 100 watts of heat that we're releasing in our sedentary state as we sit here right now. So this gives you a whole idea why in Europe right now displacement ventilation has become so popular because it's just so darn effective. If you can introduce air low and exhaust it high, you can work with nature instead of fighting with mixing, which is a less effective strategy. Even the airliners play the same game. Although they're in the cheap seats where I ride, it's only seven cubic feet a minute allotted for that seat. First class passengers get 50 in the pilot, they want to keep that due to weight, so they give them 150 cubic feet a minute. But why aren't they giving you 15 cubic feet a minute when that's considered a minimum ASHRAE standard for a sedentary person? It's real simple, because if I load a 747 up with 400 people and I fly them to Toronto, it'll cost me 400 bucks more to give them 15 CFM than seven because of the cost of compression. So these guys have learned that they can dial it down without getting too many bitches and complaints, and that's where they're settled at right now, because that seems to be a balance between selling cheap tickets and watching their fuel costs, because pilots today are rated on fuel consumption, fuel consumption in their aircraft, because it's becoming a fairly significant cost to flying this stuff around Canada. So if you look at the building code right now, just going back to the physics of it, and you take up that time, it took me a couple, three hours, to actually work through the building code to find out where we're at today and how it works. Underneath it all, it's very, very simple. If you build a new building today, or you're put, putting an addition, the building code requires that you go and pull a permit. It's got to be inspected. And it's directing you to Division B, which is basically acceptable solutions. And with acceptable solutions, Division B has got part three, part four, four, five, and six. Part six, of course, is the ventilation section. So that in a big building right now, you'll be directed to division B as a, a series of acceptable solutions. But if you have, oh yes, and also post-disaster buildings. If it's a small building, you'll be directed to part, part nine in that acceptable solutions division B. Now, what's rather interesting, if you have a large building and you have suites in it, this thing is written so that if you have suites, you can apply part six, which is a free-for-all of good engineering practice, or, and this is an or, not an and, you could use part nine, which is prescriptive, and it's actually quite stringent of what you do for ventilation today, which I'll get into. However, what is big, huge change for 2018 is if the building you're working on is participating in the step code, all of a sudden right now, your big building, which you typically engineer good entry practice under part six, the individual suites now have to be ventilated according to the prescriptive requirements of part nine. It's not an either or, it is now forcing you to use part nine prescriptive in the individual suite. And that statement is reiterated in the appendix that says, the outdoor air ducted to each suite, no appendix, the restates the age-old practice of indirect air from the corridor is not permitted. So if you read through the thread of the code, this will be a big change to how you deal with bigger buildings that have individual re residential dwelling units within that big building. Okay, everything today in ventilation really is based upon an absolute number of cubic feet, not a percentage of volume as some academics would have us do. It's based on always on a cubic feet basis. Going back to residents, what is the actual elephant in the china shop? And this was brought so clearly to our attention by RDH Engineering recently that it's been doing weatherization of some rather large concrete high-rise buildings and they'll go weatherize these buildings with a fairly big budget of windows and weatherization and stuff like that. And the first thing that's haunting them in these buildings is massive moisture problems in the suite. This has been happening in housing for years, but it's now starting to happen in big buildings as well. This came from Don Fugler. He's one of the best speakers that Tech has ever had. He's a research type with CMHC. And he provided this, which was a real shocker to the audience that test drove this on a Wednesday is the fact the biggest moisture sources in a residence is actually the people living and breathing, even dwarfing matter of the showers from those same people. The bottom line is, whether we like it or not, we are unvented combustion appliances burning cornflakes. And at the end of the day, we produce a fair bit of moisture and a fair bit of carbon dioxide, and those are direct results of our metabolism plus the additional moisture released directly from latent cooling into our environment. 
So this is not our source, not a tech source. This is simply from CMHC. And they're pretty thorough in the research that they've done. And you can see gas cooking is significant. And that's one of the reasons we have vent kitchen green, uh, exhaust that we did not have a few years ago. And you can see the relative weighting of these different moisture sources. Then the question comes up, what is the target we should be shooting for in terms of relative humidity? Well, the problem with that question is, is there's two masters you can serve, and this is why this gets into a bit of a dispute, because we haven't stopped, go back to the very simple fundamental basics, what are we trying to do? Well, the medical people would say that we're going to be most comfortable, most healthy, in about a 50% environment. 50% relative humidity, that means the air is 50% loaded in relative terms to what the air could support at that temperature. The problem is today, there's a second part of that question, and what can the building withstand? And there's very, very few buildings in this province that can withstand 50% relative humidity in the winter without havoc coming up with that relative humidity finding places that are cooler and reaching the dew point and causing damage. So you have to recognize absolutely <coughs> clearly there's two masters to serve. And while 50% is perfect for the human body and it was demanded if you're running a class A museum, you've got to run 50% nonstop plus or minus 5% tolerance. But the bottom line is, is that most buildings can't tolerate it. And that's a sad state of affair of how we build. So when we get back to ventilation, we've got to recognize, we've got to go right back to basics, and we have to look at the big problems first. Number one, I cannot stress it enough, look out for chimneys. That may be just as simple as putting a match by the draft of your water tank when you get home tonight. You want to make damn sure in all conditions that that appliance is drafting properly. Anyone today who builds a chimney on an outside wall, it's got rocks in her head. We took it out of the, couldn't get it in the code, but we got it in the appendix. So if you're building a part nine, you put a chimney on the outside wall. While it's not illegal to be that stupid, it is cautioned against that in the appendix. We've got that wording in there. Rising damp is a pig, and I won't go off on that tangent because that's a one hour talk. Radon gas is not a ventilatable pollutant. It should not be in the house. You cannot control it by dilution afterwards. You have to stop it from getting in there. And that was a fight with National to get that to happen. And lastly, volatile organic compounds are not good for you to breathe. It's better if you don't bring them in. The only way to have a healthy house is, in fact, to minimize the garbage you bring in because your ventilation, remember, is limited as a dilution technique. And dilution isn't very good. So that's a very weak technology. So what are we ventilating for? Just to sum that part up, people odor, moisture, and carbon dioxide. Dr. Fanger's effort was all in moisture. But in our experience, especially when you're dealing with about a 100 mile, hour, 100 mile radius in here, moisture and dwelling units is going to be a big bear that's going to bite you in the butt. And carbon dioxide is just one of those things that because you can measure it relatively accurately, relatively cheaply, and you can look real good with a fancy meter, but it's complete bullshit because it's not a threat until it gets to some high levels but it does give you the ability to quantify how many times the air has been breathed before you exchange it. And as a bonus, if we're meeting the ventilation requirements for people, you are doing a pretty good job of dilution of other things that we shouldn't brought in, but inevitably do get them. Now, the public perception of buildings today is they're getting tighter. And I think there's an awful lot of garbage circulated right now, but that's certainly what we've been told to believe. It's bogus, but that's the fact. The tightness of residential buildings right now is based on one thing only, the severity of the climate you build in. The colder you are, the tighter you build because the marketplace demands you do. In Vancouver, we have the reputation of building a leaky shit anywhere in the country. Now we do that simply because you have a house that's relatively cool, or a relatively mild environment, and we have cheap fuel. But the bottom line is today is that the public thinks things are getting tighter, and we know they're not because the city of Vancouver has been mandating lower door test on new construction for the last 10 years. The results haven't changed, because while the test has been mandated, the performance result has not been a requirement as part of that. The step code is going to change this once and for all, because there's now limits on tightness, minimums, should I say, maximums of leakage permitted and the various steps. And if the government have their way, we're going to see a lot of that in the near future. So, the public perception of moisture problems, we've got to go right back to where the public is because ultimately they're paying for our buildings and our services with their after-tax money. So the public thinks today we should just open up a window. Well, that has worked in the past. They believe we should install a ceiling fan. And of course, all you're doing is circulating garbage from one place to another. 
we should outlaw baseboard heaters because everyone knows baseboard heaters generate moisture. And you know that's true because everywhere in Vancouver Island has got electric baseboard heaters. The houses smell like mold and mildew because these are chimneyless heating systems. We'll get into that in a minute. But the reason that we've got ventilation in the code beginning in 1987 was driven by Ontario, excuse me, Manitoba and uh, Quebec because they're electrically driven provinces. They had cheap power. People were heating electric electrically. It was economic. And electric houses tend to be uh, tighter because you don't have an open flue, which I'll get into and quantify. We should also be outlawing thermally unbroken windows because obviously they're all the problem. They collect moisture. So being good Canadians, we cure the symptom by outlawing non-thermal breaking windows without dealing with the issues that the moisture is still being produced. Now instead of collecting the windowsill, it's going to the back closets of a lot of dwelling units and causing more havoc. We should also install forced air heating because you know that forced air heating and circulating air solves all your moisture problems, which is complete bogus. But with all these myths, there's just enough truth in them that they've continued for so long and we've got to understand the fundamentals of what's behind these myths. And of course, slash the poly vapor barrier. It's all of these moisture problems that come only because the code requires that we put poly on a wall with the average guy who's slamming that doesn't know the difference between a moisture diffusion retarder and air barrier, but we won't go there for a moment. And of course, we can install a bigger fan, and that is true because our industry has perfected the art of screening you over, in that we sold bathroom fans that have been rated at twice the rate in which they are actually truly moving, and then we strangle them with three inch flex. So a good number of you guys are going to be living in buildings today with 50 CFM fans and with 25 CFM by the combination of the fact the fans were overly zealously rated or were optimistically rated until about 10 years ago. That just about got us into a lawsuit of Tekken. And further, the fact that we now have minimum required duct diameters and three inch slinky just don't do it. The further final misconception is this is universal throughout the whole uh, building industry is there's a confusion between thermal comfort, which is a pursuit of making someone thermally comfortable, and indoor air quality. And unfortunately, if you've got ventilation and you're uncomfortably cool, a lot of people will turn it off not realizing that one is there for your health and one is there for your comfort. These are independent technologies, and that we must have both if we're going to be comfortable and we're also going to be healthy. This was a shocker that I saw about 30 years ago, just dropped me on my butt. If you take a 50 CFM bathroom fan and it's running at 25 CFM and you run it for 25 minutes, the height of this bar graph gives you an indication of how much air is being exchanged in the house. And remember, if you exhaust air, air is coming in through leakage. The, the tightness of the house is not going to diminish or age to or subtract from the amount of air that that fan has moved. But Dr. Fanger would say that an adult is going to need about 20,000 cubic feet. So you get an idea of the relative capacity that's required for human health on an odor measure and that which the average fan was moving up until a few years ago. It's not because these fans weren't moving. This is only 15 CFM. It's just the fact that 25 minutes a day is only 2% of that 24-hour period. And that's where that's, that's falling down. And with a, a larger family, you could have 100,000 cubic feet, which is 10,000 pounds, which is like five pickup trucks full of air exchange needed in a 24-hour period. So the claimed rationale for ventilation is that houses are getting tighter, which I'm going to prove is completely bogus. The real reason, however, is that the federal government, provincial government, the utilities, have had massive market forces to try to create more efficient gas appliances, whether it's boilers or furnaces. And as you know, today we have furnace efficiencies that are condensing, power vented, and have no open B vents. And the marketplace is soon, very, very quickly, pushing the standard B vented hot water tank off the platform, and we're into navians and all sorts of on demand water, which have vent systems that don't have open chimneys. The real reason that we need ventilation is because in chimneyless houses, we've had moisture problems for decades that are just plain gross. But what we're doing is our gas-fired homes now are becoming tighter because the flues have been removed rather than what's going on with the actual building enclosure itself. The unsung hero of ventilation for the last 70 years with the bringing of gas into BC was a standard furnace which not only required combustion air to burn, it had a draft diverter and a water tank, and these were co-vented 
and these were providing about 40 to 80 cubic feet a minute of air exchange in that house. The beauty of this situation, however, is that at the time, the gas code required that outdoor air be ducted directly to the return. So whenever that furnace fan ran, not only was it bringing in outdoor air, it was distributing to all the rooms of the house. So we had a 24-hour-a-day exhaust system that was running by means of this. And the joke is, if you want to improve your exhaust, just don't get the temperature of your water tank up, because that's what really was fueling the draft that was creating the ventilation of the house. And if you wanted a bit more ventilation, you could run your furnace fan continually in that way you had a continuous input of fresh air. And even the hot water boilers did that to some degree. The problem here was, although you had that same amount of exhaust taking out from the house, determined by the diameter of the chimney, the height, and its temperature, the combustion air now would basically provide some degree of air exchange in the vicinity of the boiler, which is really, really good if you had an uninsulated house exposed concrete, rising damp, the moisture would be drawn up the V-vent and wouldn't become a havoc with your bed and closets upstairs. But this was never as successful of ventilating a home as the furnace did, which had been used now since the 50s or thereabouts when natural gas came into this province. So we've got to go right back to simple common sense and see what's happening. It makes a lot more sense if we go back that way. I'm quite proud of the ventilation committee that we established in Texas some years ago. Between all of us, we have 100 ex years of experience in working in dwelling unit ventilation. We have a red seal refrigeration mechanic. We have a red seal sheet metal worker. And two people that are just focused in that case is on ventilation, I being one of them. And a professional and engineer from RDH that's done an awful lot of work in multifamilies and tried to explore some of these serious moisture problems. And we've been involved with these code evolutions from 1987 through six code cycles to where we are today, where we've had enough credibility to be able to convince the government they should advance our ventilation requirements and baby steps in such a way that they're manageable by the construction industry. But I'd also like to slay a few other dragons right now about ventilation and its cost of operation. If you look at a self-contained building right now, a, a dwelling unit, the number one factor which affects your cost of heating is the fuel cost. And anyone today who's electricity for space heating has got rocks in their head at the punitive rate that we charge for second tier power now compared to gas. What you may not know, BC Hydro is no longer regulated by the Utilities Commission, but it's a pawn of the provincial government cabinet. And the meeting I was at last night, I think we're headed to 15 cent power as soon as second seat comes on. So anyone who thinks of using gas, electricity for heating, in the raw resistance form as an idiot. Heat pump it if you're going to use electricity, but go gas if you've got any brains at all. Number two is climate. And climate is really important because you double the climate, you're going to double the cost of heating. And if you are looking at the building heat loss, it's really, really simple. Roughly 60% is going through the skin, which is a simplistic way of looking at wall steel and floor. Roughly 20% is going out through leakage, which is the shoddiness of construction. And you usually would have an allocation of roughly 10% for ventilation. But let's look at that small part right now and put some scale on it so you've got a feel for that. The factors which govern annual utility costs for ventilation, putting the biggest first. Now, believe it or not, it's the air exchange rate. And I'm dealing with a situation in our company right now where I'm seeing an 8,000 CFM HRV going to a building that needs 2,000 CFM. Who cares about the efficiency of that machine when it's oversized by 400%? We've got to start really going down to the simple basics of how much do we really need to do a job? Because there's huge price penalties to be paid for over-design and ventilation. The cost of the heat and fuel is the next thing that's covering your ventilation costs. The cost of electricity is number three. The climate severity is number four. And way back in number five position is whether you heat recovery on that ventilation air at all. And number six is the percentage, whether it's 50 or 60 or 70 percent. It becomes almost academic as to what it happens to be. You've got to remember where HRVs were developed. They were developed in the hot water heated climates, countries, excuse me, hot water heated dwelling units in Northern Europe. And they were done for two reasons. Number one, because you have a fan to move air in, a fan to move air out. You could precisely put air you want. Number two, you could take the edge off it to the point where it wasn't discomforting to people. It wasn't done for energy, it was done for comfort and effectiveness. What we did at Tekka, Brittany Hannum stepped forward from RDH, and what she did is she took a look at six different, five different climate zones, three different houses, 
all electric heat just for simplicity and commonness, and four different ventilation systems. And what she did is she said at the ventilation rates that are now required for this province right now in part nine buildings, assuming that the system is running 24 seven at the design rate, which most won't do, but it tells us exactly what the electrical allocation would be for a furnace fan or whatever else you're doing, and the heat loss that was result. And I'm gonna go through four systems here a little bit later so you can see what they consist of. But ventilation will always add to your cost, but in the trade-off for that, you're getting a healthy building. The risk of oversized ventilation, again, this is coming from the experience of the committee that's involved in this code of proposals, is it's waste thermally and electrically. The cracking of hardwood floors and finishing woods is really a nightmare, especially when you get into uh, Whistler where it's dry and unoccupied, overbuilt, and leaky. You get into the interior, it's a huge issue. Drafts and discomfort, and people tend to, in cold weather, turn ventilation off if it's too much, because it's a single vent, a single heat loss in the building that you can turn off and on with a switch, so it's often fingered as being the prime culprit when you have a high heating bill or you're a little bit cool. I went over briefly the change that came about in 2018. It applies to step code buildings. Otherwise, in Part 9 buildings, the requirements for the 2012, which were updated with an amendment in 2014, are virtually unchanged in 2018. Although we have pro uh, proposals before the provincial government to make some small changes to clean up the ragged edges that are here right now. And the people going through our ventilation course get a stand, it's an examined course, it's one day long just on this topic. The overarching changes with the amendment of 2014 were very, very, very hard to swallow. And that we now require an air exchange in bedrooms. The bedroom was singled out in the dwelling unit because it's a single room in your house. We have extended periods of occupancy. The door is often closed. And it's, there's a third reason I forgot. But it's the single most important room that you should be ventilating in a dwelling unit. So putting fresh air into a corridor does other slice, slice it. Two things that I can say that I know from personal experience in dealing with the committee. If you ever get up in the middle of the night and you raid the fridge, go to the can, come back, it's only then when your nose reawaken and you know that the air in your bed is degraded. But while you're there, you won't notice it. But when you come in with a fresh nose, you'd be quite surprised at how the air quality in that occupied room with the door closed has been compromised over the last three or four hours. Number two, what we found in ventilation in bedrooms is that many people wake up stuffy at night when they're properly ventilated. There, there's quite a change that people will find that they don't wake up stuffy in the morning, which they thought was just inherently their own physi physiological problem. But in fact, it is tied to inadequate air exchange at night. It's really, really important. The second thing is this ventilation system must be continuous, which was a big, huge step. Those two things of continuous and distribution of bedrooms was a pretty hard swallow for the province, but we felt as a committee, as time has come, and to some degree, building policy branch was pushing us that way anyway, in the false belief that houses were getting tighter and this was becoming more important. Just remember, it's, a, it's the removal of the venting that's made the biggest change to the rising of relative humidity in houses in the province. And our trade has seen a lot of that right now by removing gas-fired appliances that would be vent and putting in condensing appliances. If the house was on the threshold of moisture problems before, it will transfer across that threshold and be problems where it was not before. And the principle of ventilation system sizing was based on ASHRAE standard 62.2 in 2010, which was the latest standard at the time that we did that. And the interesting thing was, for most moderate-sized houses, you know, 1,500 to 3,000 square feet, you know, two or three bedrooms. <coughs> it seems that it's really almost magic that those numbers happen to be exactly the same as what our gas vented appliances were providing us from the 50s right on up until the demise of the B vented furnace water tank pair. And we um, have bathroom ventilation, either 20 continuous, 50 intermittent. The only change recently is we now have 100 CFM in the kitchen, and that kitchen requirement was put in only recently. It was lobbied in for two reasons. Number one, the uh, housing authority, BC Housing, pushed for it because people were tri triggering smoke detectors and disconnecting them when they cook. They were used as dinner alarms. And number two, there's a fair bit of CO coming off of gas ranges and ovens. 
and the gas company is quite insistent that we have a universal 100 CF in our kitchens so it would make the electric and the gas become equivalent in relative safety terms. The entire ventilation in this province is predicated then on ventilating at a continuous rate at this. In other words, your installed capacity must be those rates. It's based on the principal exhaust fan, although that can, could be of many different types. There are four different methods of bringing fresh air in just to cycle through them quickly. You can go right back to where we were in the 1950s, and put a principal exhaust fan in, bring outdoor air into the return, the furnace fan runs continually, and we've perfectly replicated mechanically what all houses had in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s with an air exchange right now, established by that table with the principal fan and the outdoor air coming into that furnace. Simple, practical, cheap. And that's the workhorse of ventilation going on in this province right now. And it does meet the criteria of the bedroom air exchange, which is number one. If you are using an HRV, you could do it very similarly. You could put an HRV in here. You have to draw air from a higher point in recognition of the ASHRAE, understanding of the air quality of the ceiling of the upper levels being worse. That's exhausted. Fresh air comes into the return, and that furnace now provides distribution just like the previous example. The HRV can also be used in a hot water heated house, and one of the powerful parts of it is a supply fan that allows you to mechanically deliver air directly to your bedrooms. Very, very effective. In fact, in hot water heated houses right now, it's a system of choice. The third system was created to allow those that are being ground badly by developers in multifamily with baseboard or hot water radiant systems for heat and multi levels of using a miniature version of the past where you have outdoor air from the outside mixing with living room air, mixing in a small fan and delivered to bedrooms so you're mechanically bringing it back into bedrooms. It works very, very well. A, a lower cost system than an HRV and it's universal in climate if you can use it. The fourth one is something that's a little bit new for BC and certainly the only place in Canada that you can use it. And it's a replica that has been used in the millions in Europe where they have small exhaust that runs 24-7, and the slight depressurization of your single level dwelling unit allows you to bring air in through inlets. At the time this was drafted, we were hoping that we would be able to bring air right through window sashes, but then window standard kibosh that. But it does work very, very effectively, but there's extreme limitations of this system. It's used a lot in secondary suites and single level flats. It's very good right on up to Revelstoke, Castle Butter, Squamish in terms of geographical region. It's got a limitation of square footage, one story, no forced air heating, no exterior chimney. So there's an awful lot of dwelling units right now that will fit within the criteria that limits the application of that example for it. What I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time on what's going on in Europe because they're leaving us in the dust and we're just not smart enough to listen to them. 50 years ago, a company, Serva, which was uh, basically founded by two engineering individuals from France, uh, sponsored by the Electric Utility of France, developed a flow regulator. It's an absolutely beautiful piece of technology because they have a lot of six floor buildings there. They put a fan on the roof, they draw air from all the suites, but the problem is the upper suite got most exhaust and the ones at the bottom got less just due to the normal stack restriction or duct restriction. They developed a very simple piece of technology which would give you a, a diaphragm opening so that as you try to push more air through this would self-regulate. So you could buy a 15 or 20 or 30 CFM one, stick it in the duct, and you'd guarantee that when the fan was running, you'd guarantee an even distribution of exhaust amongst all the bathrooms in the building. And you could buy whatever size you want. It's really, really beautiful. This is obsolete right now, and we haven't even heard of it in this country because it was developed 70, well, 1970, 70, 30, 50, 50 years ago. Since then, they've got three generations of improvement, and it's really quite beautiful. They've recognized years ago in, in uh, France, which, by the way, in Paris, it's a dead ringer for the climate we have in Vancouver in terms of enthalpy on a month-by-month -month basis. But they had an older generation where it would modulate according to the relative and dwelling area, which is quite beautiful in advance for its time. Manual override, then they went to pneumatic override, to now where it's gone to the next generation of occupancy sensing. It's beautiful, it's simple, it's reliable, but we're not there yet. Why? Because we don't have ductwork right now adequate to support this kind of technology. Even this very, very simple system is a challenge right now because we don't have good enough ductwork. 
the beauty of that, it goes four to one between open and its relaxed state, dealing with the fact that you need a lot of exhaust temporarily from bathrooms. But drying towels in this city and this lower mainland is a pig because it takes 12 hours to dry a towel. And that's something which, if you don't exhaust on a continuous basis, that moisture will evaporate into the room and then it looks for cool surfaces to collect onto. Not good. What we've done, and there's some business opportunities for you people here, is get involved in testing duct, because you'd be horrified at what you find. But um, we bought this machine from Minneapolis Orador people about 20 years ago, and it's just amazing what we've learned over the years. And this little wee video is something that I think you might just get a kick out of. It's not to point fun at any particular manufacturer's product, but it sure points out something clearly. Now the problem is, is that this elbow is a good production elbow, it's something we use in the trade every day. But between the three gores and the joints, there's eight feet of crack length in this one place. <coughs> the problem with small residential systems, we're moving such a little wee wee bit of air that by the time you stretch this all over the building, you've got a vast amount of footage, an awful lot of fittings, they're a very, very small amount of air. And what we've found over 20 years is these systems are leaking between 30 and 50%. So how the dickens can you size a ventilation system when you get a ductwork system is completely out of control? It's really quite sad. But that's one of the biggest obstacles we have for decent ventilation. Well, 10 years ago, we bought, we bought a, a, smoke, uh, a smoke generator, a theatrical smoke generator that the rock bands used on stage. And it sat in a warehouse for five years because we just couldn't get bothered around using it. But boy, oh boy, is that a fun tool. We go up and test a ductwork system and turn it around backwards, you pressurize it, put smoke into it, and man alive, the trade out there is absolutely unbelievable response <coughs> to see the actual measurable and visual results of the workmanship. The particular photograph I'm citing here is actually a job that we did up in um, Penn Harbor, and it was a 16-unit apartment, and we found the fire dampers contributed 50% of the overall system leakage. It was absolutely dismal disgrace at the leakage of just the actual fire dam. The rest of the system is actually done quite well. Well, there's a product on the market right now. It was developed by Lawrence Berkeley Labs. In fact, the son of the developer I just met here in Vancouver, the Passive House Conference here about a month ago, <coughs> they developed a product called AeroSeal. And what it is, it's an aerosol product. It's a rubberized type of compound. You pressurize a ductwork system. You release this in through the fan. And as that pressurized product goes through the gores of an elbow and through joints, as it changes direction, it deposits its uh, rubberized material in the same way as air goes through the door, it leaves dirt stains in an on web strip door. This will leave its actual dry products of this little rubber latex material. And I personally witnessed, this doesn't show up, this is a situation where it went from 95 CFM down to 2 CFM in roughly 60 minutes. It's absolutely unbelievable. Now, the franchisee of this outfit is an arrogant bunch of pricks. But the net result is that this technology is superb. There's one piece of machinery in Vancouver right now. I'm hoping that it was, uh, it was liquidated in the sale of a company recently. I'm hoping it will be turned over to a new company author because it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful service. You guys want to look at it. Technology is sound, but no one's been able to make a go of it. Because the guys who run air seal are running around to all the states of the union where duct testing is mandatory and they set up shop there and they don't care about the rest of the continent. It's really sad. I chew their ass out every time I go to ASHRAE at their conference, but it doesn't make good. I try to get them up here to speak to us and they won't bother. Maybe it's my tone. <laughs> Basically, where ventilation has been very, very um, successful commercially right now is custom houses. People love it. Well, this has been a rather interesting thing right now in Sun Peaks. As uh, you probably well imagine, in a ski hill, you're dealing with some serious moisture problems, high occupancy in the ski season, drying clothes, and most of the ski hills they are electric heat, so they're chimneyless heating, and they're just a prime candidate for a massive mold and mildew problem, mainly by the simple fact that you simply have a relatively tight building, necessitated by the fact that you have a cold climate, baseboard heat, no chimneys. The combination of high occupancy makes this kind of a building a replica of what's been happening in Europe now for 40 years. We have high occupancy, high cost of fuel, and you end up with a moisture problem as a direct result. We've been playing there with a very avant-garde builder dance construction. They've been really quite exemplary because they've been to Europe many, many times, and they've learned the hard way that you've got to deal with this kind of thing in front of you. And this is something I'm just 
proud as hell. I have some work John Ning pieces done with Jade West Engineering, where he's treating this seriously with proper ventilation and proper protocol and testing that work systems. Just a case in point, I just had a spec crosser desk recently. The engineer was smart enough to specify duct testing be done, but guess how the spec was written? The system shall pass a test at two inches of water column, which of course is 10 times what we normally see, but there's no measure of leakage. So what were we testing? The duct work wasn't so badly put apart, put together to blow apart the joints. If you don't measure leakage, it's totally worthless to measure the, the pressure. It's just, uh, it just doesn't do you any good. And of course, ventilation, believe it or not, the enthalpy does work in our favor, that the difference in indoor and outdoor conditions, ventilation is extremely effective in the pools. The comments, just to summarize this whole talk, is the comments you're getting from people are really quite interesting. Um, I think that ventilation is the best thing I could install my new home. Next door neighbor really regrets not installing my build. And the same thing with the second comment, but I'd like to summarize just one comment that I made, because we've been at this long enough that we've had people put ventilation in the first house, they didn't think it was doing anything for them, they didn't put it in the second house, and they get so mad they put it in the third. It's just human psychology. But I leave you with a closing comment today. I believe today to, we can no longer rely on the state for helping us maintain health. We've got to be a lot more careful today on what we eat, what we breathe, and what we drink, because the state isn't looking after for us, the medical profession, and the, the, the healthcare industry is going to take us to bankruptcy if we continue to think as we have in the last 20 years. But thank you. If there were time, I could certainly get into other stuff, but I think that's all you want to hear from me tonight. Are there any questions and things you could throw at this that um, may help you personally or in your business? Mm -hmm. I'll give you an opinion if not a good answer. <laughs> Gosh, you guys are chilling. <laughs> <laughs> Say something, John. Huh? Yes, sir. For condo buildings? Yeah, uh, don't get me going. Um, see, the ERV has been grossly oversold in this location. And I think grossly oversold. And the prime reason they've been oversold is you don't require a drain on them. But let's forget about the difficulties of installation right now and go back to the fundamentals of what you're trying to do. In a dwelling unit right now, our primary concern is controlled moisture. Because we're dealing, if you want, on the Tekka website, we have a psychometric presentation 90 minutes long talking about our ventilation code and comparing to Fino, Vancouver, um, uh, Soyuz, and Fort St. John. Well, what happens right now is we're dealing with very, very high outdoor relative humidity, so our ability to control moisture indoors is hugely handicapped with what we start with. It may have some merits in Dawson Creek, but it's got no merit whatever. In my opinion, right now, the city of Vancouver showing an HRV can be used in place, or ERV can be used in place of HRV, is reflecting complete lack of any understanding of the codes they're making. And I said that to them point blank. It doesn't make that. Yes? So the houses are not getting any tighter what? kind of uh, air sheet rates or still like seven. City of Vancouver right now is running between three and eight, and that hasn't changed for 10 years. And that's to a large degree simply because the public doesn't care and the builder has not had to bother doing anything because while he has to lower door test that house in completion for occupancy, there has been no requirement for me to spec. That's gonna change drastically with the step code because of our limits. Although the whole metric for that limit of air change per hour is a flawed metric. So it penalizes the small buildings as you well know and rewards the builders of the big buildings. It's a flawed metric. But at least the concept of, of testing and having to re reach a result is a commendable um, objective, as you well know. We're building more energy additional, so targeting the air tank is not open. We're commonly building one fire to less. It's very commendable objective. So Well, I'd like to say that if you're building tight, it certainly would make the need of ventilation greater because you can't count a runaway air exchange. But what everyone forgets is that a leaky building has no air exchange in the shoulder seasons unless you're in a windy exposed area. The whole idea of mechanical ventilation is to provide an ongoing exchange independent of outdoor condition. 
The reason for draft proofing house is predominantly because we want to be comfortable, and yes, it saves energy, because you cannot be comfortable if you're living in a Swiss cheese box. So I'd like to differentiate right now two things, and really, really clearly thank you very much for that, Ken, is that comfort can only come from a building that's thermally well built, and that has two components. It's got to have good thermal insulation with minimum thermal bridging. It's got to be draft free. It's got to be it. And then your heating system has to be sized to match the loss on a room basis. That's comfort, and that's economy, and that's completely aside from the ventilation, which is then based upon the number of bedrooms, because that's the best indicator of new construction of intended occupancy, and therefore the need of air exchange on the continuous basis. So I'd like to leave the message that way, is that tightness is there, is very much proven to be advantageous from a point of view of energy, but the more saleable advantage of tightness in this regime of mild climate and a very, very low-cost heating fuel is you'll have nothing like the comfort if it's tight and it's acoustically silent. They're beautiful, absolutely beautiful, compared to living in the junker I lived in, which is 1952 and is an eight-year change per hour and lower the result. Gosh, only two people are willing to stick their neck up. You guys, I didn't want to get out of here. You had enough of me. Lock your games up. Thank you. So my takeaway for tonight is I can go home and tell my wife that I learned about ventilation when the earth was cold. Sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't resist on that slide back home. Well, I'm too thick to understand the full impact of what you said. <laughs> <laughs> when the earth was cold. Going back to history with, um, with um, starting in 1700. Okay. Yeah, I was being fun. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Still missed it, but we're thanks anyway. We're good so. Okay. So no we're, harm taken, Peter. We're, we're grateful that you can come and join us tonight. And uh, to show our appreciation, we'd like to present you this Asherite portable um, battery charger. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.